1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 17 through 21. And if we would stand this afternoon in honor of the reading of God's word, amen. If anything deserves honor, the word of God deserves honor, amen. 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 21. And the King James text today reads, Charge them that are rich in this world. Let me get it up there for you as well. If I can. Well, all right. Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high minded nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy that they do good and that they be rich in good works ready to distribute willing to communicate laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come that they may lay hold on eternal life. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee, Amen. That's 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 16 through 21. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment as we go to the Lord in prayer once again. Father, we love you. We thank you, God, for the word of the Lord. It is the very bread that we eat. It is the breath that we breathe. It provides for us the nourishment for our soul. That is so desperately necessary as we walk in fellowship and in communion with you. I humble myself, O oh God, before you at this hour. Lord, I acknowledge today that there is nothing in me. I have no, I have no talents, no abilities outside of the anointing of the Holy Ghost whereby... I might deliver a word to the people of God that would be of help to them, that would inspire and encourage them, that would cause their faith, Lord, to blossom and to grow. But the anointing of the Holy Ghost, that touch from heaven, that speaks a word of approval as the minister of the gospel delivers the word of God, that anointing is able, God, to change lives. It's able to bring salvation to the lost. It's able to bring healing to the sick, deliverance to those who are bound and oppressed. Send forth your word through me at this hour that it might accomplish that for which you would send it. Master, touch us, inspire us, encourage us. Cause our faith today, God, to bloom mighty, powerfully, that we might be able to walk in victory over every temptation, every trial, every tribulation that comes our way. For we ask it today, O oh God, in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this hour. Miss Laid Faith, I finally got that panel to change. Of course, you'll notice it did by the time we were done with everything else. You know, you didn't need it by then. Amen. Mislaid faith. Paul writes to the young man who was, in every sense of the word, a spiritual son to him. He was something of a, uh, an apprentice, as it were, in ministry. And Paul would write to Timothy, the epistles that Paul wrote to Timothy were written with great care and with great love because Paul thought a lot of Timothy and Timothy thought a lot of Paul. 
I'm glad that in my life and in my walk with God and in my ministry, I've had a Paul or two in my life. Amen. Uh -huh. I'm glad I've had ministers of the gospel who saw the call of God in my life and they reached out to me to offer me advice and counsel. They sought to educate me in ministry and to help me to know how to walk and how to live with integrity. So that as I ministered to the people of God, I would not have a trail behind me of trash that was distracting from the word I was delivering. I'm glad I've had some great men in my life. Brother J.T. Gillum of Fort Worth, Texas of the Riverside Church of God, you hear me talk of him often. Brother Gillum probably was my premier Paul. If it wasn't for Brother Gillum, I wouldn't understand the power of the Holy Ghost like I understand it today. If it wasn't for Brother Gillum, I wouldn't understand the liberty and worship that I understand today. If it wasn't for Brother Gillum, I wouldn't understand, Lisa, that there is a, ne a necessary balance in our Christian walk. You cannot be all dogmatic and gung-ho and foolish in one area and at the same time be hypocritical and two-sided and talking out of two sides of your mouth in another area. Brother Gillum was old-time holiness. He believed in the high hair and the long sleeves and all that, and he lived it. And I remember before I started my first church Brother Gillum said to me something that a lot of holiness people today will gag when they hear me say it. Because it doesn't fit with their idea of how this issue is to be handled. But Brother Gillum taught me, he said, Chuck, the outside is easy. It's the inside that takes work. He said, it isn't hard to get folk who start coming to a holiness church to conform and to dress a certain way and to look a certain way. He said, but if they don't get their insides straightened up, if they don't get gossip off their lips, if they don't get backbiting out of their heart, if they don't get malice and hatefulness out of their spirit, he said, then they're just going to look one thing and be something else. That's right. He said, the outside is easy. Don't preach the outside. See, a lot of holiness preachers spend all their time, Lisa, preaching about how you dress. They preach about how a woman ought to wear her hair. They preach about whether or not you should wear jewelry or makeup or men should wear long hair or short pants. And in the process of putting all their energy into the externals, they neglect the internals. And generally speaking, I hate to say this because I know it sounds mean, but unfortunately it's true. Most of these preachers simply breed a bunch of hypocrites who appear one thing on the outside, but live something very differently on the inside. Some of the most hateful, nasty, mean-spirited, malicious people I know who identify as Christians have that holiness look. Hmm. All their hairs piled on their head, their sleeves come down to here. Bless God. Oh, they live by such a strict standard so that they can appear to be these consecrated, dedicated people of God. And yet all they ever hear preached, Tommy, is the external. So all they ever know how to live is the external. They don't get enough teaching about the internal. Well, I had a Paul in my life who helped me to understand that there's a balance, that you cannot afford to devote your energy to what is the easiest part. He said, do you know how to get people in your church to to live the standard that we believed. He said, you simply live it. As the pastor, you live it. He said, and the people will fall behind. And I thought, hmm, 
I was 19 years old when I started my first church on behalf of the Church of God. And guess what I did, Lisa? Now, I wasn't married. I didn't have a wife to set the example for the ladies. But I lived the example for the men. I never preached what we call clothesline preaching. I never preached on women's hair and makeup and jewelry. But I did teach on it in Bible studies and what have you. And you know, I never had a problem one with people living to that standard and living up to that. Simply because, primarily, I lived the example. Brother Gillum said, if you lead by example, the people will follow. He said, the most important thing you can do is live by example. Well, Paul took Timothy under his wing. He knew Timothy's parents. He knew Timothy's family. He took this young man of God under his wing and he tried to offer him counsel. He tried to offer him advice. He tried to educate him so that when Timothy went into ministry and Timothy began to do the work of God, that he could go in as prepared and as qualified as possible. Sadly, we have a lot of people in the church world today who call themselves called of God into ministry and Lisa they want to rush out the door and they want to do the work of God they have a fervor they have a zeal but they have not taken the time to prepare themselves if there is any work in the world that you ought to be careful and prayerful to prepare yourself for it is the work of the ministry no greater damage can be done to the human soul than by someone who claims to be a man or woman of God who is ill-equipped and ill-prepared for the work that they are doing. If you do not have a Paul in your life, then you have no business stepping out in ministry. You better have someone over you who is able to rebuke you when you need to be rebuked. You better have someone over you who is able to guide you when you need guidance. You better have someone over you whom you can go to and whom you can inquire of when you have questions about circumstances and situations that you're uncertain of. I remember in my first church, I had a situation arise and it was a doozy. It was a real, real doozy. And I responded to this situation according to what I felt was the leading of the Holy Ghost. I was just 19, maybe 20 by then, but I think I was 19 still. And uh, I responded to this situation. After a while, I spoke with the pastor that I had served my internship under. I've tried to offer internships in this church. I've tried to tell people who Lisa contacted me and said they wanted, they felt called to go out and do affirming ministry. I said, fine, but if you want this church to stand behind you, you're going to need to make some major sacrifices. You're going to need to do some very serious things to prepare yourself for the work of God. You're going to need to uproot yourself and move to Dallas for at least a year or two. What? said, if you think I'm going to put my name behind you, if you think I'm going to put this work behind you, and all I've known of you is a phone call or a letter in the mail or an email or two, I said, you're out of your mind. No, you need to come here. You need to struggle and work hard to make a living and do what you've got to do to provide for yourself. And at the same time, you need to serve under this pastor so that I can train you and teach you and help you to understand all the various caveats of affirming ministry. Because affirming ministry is nothing in the world like any other ministry you've ever been a part of. If you think you're going to be able to do things like they do at first church over here or second church over there, so, oh, honey, then you are going to fall flat on your face. I've been 
doing this kind of work now since 1993. I've watched church after church after church open and then shortly thereafter close. Because they cannot get people who are faithful. They cannot get people who are willing to support the work they're doing. And the minister gets discouraged and the minister gets tired. Well, maybe if you had gone and gotten with somebody who's been doing this for 25 years. Who had to live through those dry spells. Who had to keep pushing when nobody would come to church. Maybe you'd have found a way to encourage yourself and keep going. Even when things look dark and when things look bleak. Maybe you'd have found the secret to keeping yourself encouraged and continuing to do the work that you've been called to do. Because affirming ministry is not by any means a sprint. Mm -mm. It is a marathon. <laughs> Honey, if you think you're going to get big results in the short spell, you're out of your mind. You are going to have to invest years and years in the community that you go into. So if you go in and you get yourself all committed to uh, paying a big price for meeting space and doing all this right off the starting line, you're just setting yourself up for a fail. And if you'd have come and been part of this church and been willing to allow me to be the Paul to your Timothy, I could have helped you to understand the best way to approach things and the best way to go in so that even when you were struggling and struggling and it, it, it seemed like nobody wanted to come and be part of this thing, that you could have stayed in there and hung in because eventually you will break through. It's taken this work years. I've been in Dallas 16 years. It's taken us Years just to get the crowd we've got here today. And we're by no means, you know, a great crowd. <laughs> but it's taken us years just to get a nucleus together of people who are committed and who believe in the work that we're doing and who are willing to support it. I'm going to tell you, if you're going to go into affirming ministry, you need a Paul in your life. You need someone to help teach you and train you. You need to make whatever sacrifices are necessary to prepare yourself. I'll tell you why. Because when you get out there, you're going to have to make more sacrifices to do the work you're doing. So you might as well learn to sacrifice in the process of your training. And I tell them the truth today. Amen. Many in the church today, Lisa, have mislaid their faith. Their confidence is no longer in the God of their salvation and in the precious sacred word of God, but their confidence instead is in man-made religions, philosophies, the sciences, medicine, and traditions. Many in the church are vehemently struggling to gain influence in the world and in the political arena. And I'm going to tell you today, the world is well aware that these so-called Christians are very selective about the passages of God's Word, which they are willing to believe and submit themselves to. Oh, the world knows. The world knows people whose faith is mislaid. They know Christians who trust more in the political realm than they do in God. Hello now. They know Christians today who believe more in medicine than they do in the Word of God. They know Christians today who believe more in science than they do in the Word of God. Because in order to do that, you have got to mislay your faith. You've got to put your faith places your faith don't belong. You got to believe things that you're not supposed to be believing. <laughs> and the world sees you and they know, oh, this is one of those people with mislaid faith. They don't have their full and complete confidence in the Word of God. No, they don't believe God above all else. No, their, their affections 
minds and their intentions are split. Johnny, they have believed God and they have believed the scientists. They have believed God and they have believed the medical professionals. If I believed the medical professionals today, I'd be dead because in 2000, the medical professionals said I had 24 hours to live. I didn't believe the medical professionals. I believed God. When Brother Ronnie sent a prayer cloth to me from Phoenix, Arizona, and I got that prayer cloth, and my mother read his little letter that he wrote to me telling me how much I was needed in this movement and how I couldn't go anywhere because I was needed. I'm telling you, I took that prayer cloth in my hand, and immediately I was intubated, so I couldn't speak but I looked up toward heaven with tears in my eyes. And in my mind, I thought, all right, Lord, they're believing you for a miracle. I'm believing you for a miracle. I know what the Word of God says. Let's get this done. Hallelujah to God. I didn't believe what the doctor said. I didn't care what the scientist said. I know what the Word of God says. And that's where my confidence was. Yeah. And it wasn't partly in the Word of God and partly in the doctors. Mm -hmm. No, honey, it was wholly, completely, entirely in the Word of God. Hallelujah. Amen. The old song said, Jesus said it. I believe it and it's so. Hallelujah. If the Lord said it, it is so. I've seen so many miracles in my life not only personally have I experienced these miracles, but I have witnessed miracle after miracle after miracle growing up in the Pentecostal church. I've seen people that Dr. said would never be able to walk again. One girl I grew up in church with, Ruth, Ruthie, Ruthie broke her neck. She was deaf, and she broke her neck while swimming. And I went to the hospital. I saw her when they had drilled these screws down into her head so they could put her in traction and all this. And they could not repair the damage that was done. And they told Ruthie she would be forever paralyzed from here down. And with those screws in her head, <laughs> she looked up at them and said, Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> she said, oh, no, I won't. She said, you don't know the God I serve. Oh, here was a girl who believed the doctors. Her faith, excuse me, who believed God, not the doctors. Her faith, Lisa, was not mislaid. It was not in the wrong place. She looked up at them, unable to move her head, and said, oh, no, I won't. I will walk again. You don't know the God I serve. And I watched her walk down the aisle of the church I grew up in. Hallelujah to God. Don't tell me that the word of God cannot be trusted. You're talking to the wrong duck. <laughs> I had the opportunity during my trip to Florida this week. It was God is so wonderful. The Lord is so good. When I fly, I have to request chair service. You know, I have to request somebody to push me in a chair around the airport. I still have a little bit of trouble with my legs uh, ever since I got out of the hospital. That's kind of my, my limp. You remember when uh, uh, Jacob wrestled with the angel of the Lord, and after he wrestled with the angel of the Lord, the angel of the Lord touched the hollow of his thigh, and he had a reminder of that wrestling match. Everywhere Jacob went, he lived. Well, I have a reminder of that hospitalization in 2000. I do very well. I generally do very well. But if I have to walk long, long distances over a long period of time, my legs start to bother me, and it can get to the point where I can't hardly function the day after or so, you know? So when I go to the airports and everything, it's really more of a preventative thing than it is, you know, it's not that I can't walk, but it's that uh, I, if I walk through that entire airport and I have to do, you know, everything by foot, I won't be able to walk tomorrow. So it's more preventative than anything. 
So I got to the Love Field Airport and asked for a chair, and they helped me in. And they pushed me up to the gate, and they set me next to this lady. And after a few minutes, I mentioned something about my flight being delayed, and the lady said, oh, Lord, what flight are you on? And I told her. She said, no, it can't be that flight. She said, that's the flight I'm on. And I said, oh, yes, ma'am. I said, here, look, this is my app. You know, it tells you when the flight, it was delayed by two hours. So we sat there side by side, and we began to talk. And I told her, I said, I'm going to see my mom for Mother's Day. I always try to go and spend a few days with my mother, do a little bit of work around the house, do what I got to do. And I said, uh, you know, it's just a little tradition I've tried to start. And I said, my mother lives on Merritt Island. And this lady said, oh, my goodness, I live on Merritt Island. <laughs> I said, you do? She said, yes, I do. She said, you know, if you need a ride to Merritt Island from uh, the airport, I said, well, no, ma'am, I've already rented a car because I'm going to be there a few days, so I always like to have a car to get around in, you know. And long story short, we talked, and she's a child of God. She's a Christian lady, goes to church on Merritt Island, and we begin to talk. And, of course, our flight's delayed two hours. We we're supposed to get on... Uh, in Orlando about 11. Now we're not going to get into 1 in the morning. And I said to her, I said, listen, how about this? Instead of your children having to come get you at the airport at 1 in the morning, why don't you just let me carry you to Merritt Island? I've rented the car. I'm going to have to go to Merritt Island no matter how you slice it. So I might as well carry you. That'll save your kids making the trip and paying the tolls and so on and so forth. So long story short, that's what we did. I drove her. Her name's Bobby. She said she's going to try to be watching us today. Hi, Bobby, if you're out there watching. Hello. And uh, so I drove her into Merritt Island. Turns out she was not but a mile and a half from my mother. Wow. Merritt Island's very small to begin with. It's not a real, real big community. So, it, you know, I figured at best she'd only be five, six, seven minutes away, you know. But she turned out to be about a mile and a half from my mother. <laughs> and I drove her to the house and dropped her off and all. But as we were traveling, we're talking about the Lord. I'm going to tell you, I love when you can meet somebody who calls himself a child of God, and the conversation never one time turned to Trump. The conversation never one time turned to Obama. The conversation never one time uh, even mentioned Republicans or Democrats. I'm telling you, that's the kind of conversation people of God ought to be having. Yes. We don't need to be talking about the political things in this world. We need to be talking about the goodness of God. We need to be talking about the surety of God's Word. We need to be talking about the testimonies of healing and deliverance and salvation that God has given us. We need to be talking about the goodness of God. And that's what Bobby and I did. We just talked about the goodness of God. I told her, I said, I'll tell you what. If people try to tell me God's not real and you cannot trust his word and you cannot have confidence in his word, I said, they're barking up the wrong tree. They're wasting their energy on me. And she said, me too. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Made myself a new friend. Uh -huh. Amen. Amen. She said, I'm going to watch your services. I'm going to be there at 4 o'clock Florida time so I can watch your services. Amen. Mislaid faith. How many of us today, I know a lot of Christians who just, they feel like, Bill, they have to somehow or another work evolution into their belief system. Because if I don't, I'm going to look stupid in front of the world. People in the world are going to think I'm stupid because I don't believe in evolution. And after all, science is a, an established fact. And science says evolution is how we got here. So, so I tell people, well, I believe in, in, in God creating and I believe in evolution. Oh, really? That's what I call mislaid faith. Because you're taking part of your confidence and putting it in science and part of your confidence and putting it in the Word of God. I don't know how God did everything He did. I don't know how it all played out, Bill. I can't say I wasn't there. I don't know. But I'll tell you what, I will not say, I will not speak any further than God speaks. 
The Bible said that God spoke the word and the worlds came into existence. So whether evolution was part of that or not, it don't matter to me. I'm not going to say any more than the word of God says. Hello now. The word of God says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That is what I believe. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How that process played out is God's to deal with, not mine. I'm not going to stand there and try to put half my confidence in science and half my confidence in the word of God. You'll notice in our primary text today, the Apostle Paul told Timothy in verse 20, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings, and listen, and oppositions of science, falsely so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. You know what I call that? Mislaid faith. Mm -hmm. He said some people get so caught up in arguing and debating the science. We've got Christians today go out of their way to try to prove scientifically that creation is truth. Well, I got news for you. Uh, the Bible teaches that if we're to come to God, we have to come to God by faith. God never, not one time, Johnny, promised that he would prove himself scientifically so that you could believe on him. No, mm -hmm. you don't believe God because science supports God. Hello now. Right. I don't believe God because science supports God. I believe God because I've put my confidence in the Word of God. I've put my confidence in Him. And over the course of the years, He has proven to me personally over and over and over again that He is real, that He keeps His Word, that He honors His promises, is that if you put your faith in that which he has spoken, he is faithful to do that which he has committed himself to doing. He's proven that to me over and over again. Now I can tell some people the testimonies of the things God's done for me and they won't believe me. They won't believe that God's real just because I lay in a hospital for a month being told daily that I had 24 hours to live and yet God somehow or another raised me up in one single day, took me from life support one day to being off life support the next, fully able to support my own breathing, all because some friends of mine in Phoenix, Arizona sent me a prayer cloth that they had prayed over in Jesus' name, anointed with oil, and believed God for my healing. And when I got that cloth the next day, oh, it's just a big coincidence that the next morning I woke up and they were able to take me off life support. It's just a coincidence that immediately my body began to repair. Immediately the uh, pneumonia began to dissipate and to disappear from my lungs. They had been treating me for a month without a single change. All of a sudden, boom, I get this prayer cloth, things change. Yeah, it's just coincidence. You can believe it's coincidence. I believe it's God. Amen. I believe it's God. God has proven himself to me over and over again. I've told the story before, but I'll tell it again. Tommy, when I first met him, bless his heart, he was working at the bank. And he was struggling, and he's putting in, you know, all the hours, and he's working as hard as he can work. And he's just frustrated out of his mind because it seems like every time they give a raise, they're giving him the, the lowest, you know, end of the raise, even though they're giving him glowing reports, but, you know. But they're still giving him these little wincy raises. And every time a promotion comes, somehow or another, they're skating past him. And he's telling me, boy, I'll tell you, it makes me mad because every time a promotion comes, I'm missing the promotion. Every time a raise comes, if they're, if they're giving raises between 1% and 8%, I'm getting 4% or I'm getting 3%, you know. And he was all frustrated. And, and he and I were given and given and given to this ministry from the get-go. He was given a lot even from the earliest stages before he even believed our message. He was trying to help me. 
Well, don't help me, help God. Amen. Don't help me, give to God. Don't give to me. I think the problem a lot of people have given to these TV preachers is you're given to the preacher rather than given to the work of God. If you give with the mindset, Lord, I'm doing this for the advancement of the kingdom, not so I can get something back. Well, he and I were constantly having to kick in in order to keep the work alive, you know, keep things going. And I said to him one day, I said, you know, if you would just tithe and just give that 10%, I would never ask you. I wouldn't. I don't do it to any of y'all either. I said, I'd never ask you for any more than that. And I will work with that amount. See, that's part of the reason that God designed tithing. It creates a dependable budget. The church, if the members tithe, uh, Johnny, I know every month, okay, well, this is roughly how much we're going to have to work with. So I'm able to make decisions based on that amount. If we just open it up and say, well, y'all just give whatever you feel like giving, you know, you know, blah, 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 then what's going to happen is you, everybody's going to give the least they can possibly get away with if they give it all. And you're not going to know what's coming in month to month or week to week. You have no idea what you're working with. You constantly have to ask for more. Hello now. No. God designed tithing for a reason. Did you hear what I said, folks? God designed tithing. Pastor Charles didn't design it. God designed it for a reason. Because God is a God of order. God is a God of structure. He likes things to be done in a way that it works. So I know what our church budget is every month, and I keep our bills. I try to, I don't commit us to things that we can't afford to pay for because I know how much we take in. Do you follow what I'm saying? Well, I said to him, now mind you, at the time, he'd be the only tither. <laughs> or, I'm sorry, I think my mom tithed at the time too. And I said, if you would just tithe, then I would take that amount and that and that would be it. That's all I'd ask of you. And I would work with that. So he decided, all right, I'm going to start tithing. He started tithing. If I'm wrong, Tommy, I want you to give a, a Tarzan holler, okay? Oh, 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 oh. If I'm lying, you do that. And that will tell the world that I'm lying. He started tithing. All of a sudden, guess what happened? Every time he got a review, he got a glowing review. Well, he had been getting glowing reviews all along. But when they give raises, they were giving him the high end of the raise. They were giving him the top end of the raise. When promotions came, they were giving him the promotion. All of a sudden now, Tommy is the vice president in his division at his bank after all these years, and he's making a good salary. He's making good money. You see, God began to bless and open blessing up in his life, and Tommy has sat back in the last 16 years and watched me as the Lord has blessed and blessed and blessed, had me. Uh -huh. Yep. I've had situations arise where a lady that visited our church had her window broke out. She, on her car. While she was visiting our church, we went out for fellowship afterwards and somebody broke the window out, stole some stuff out of her car. And I felt so bad. I didn't want her to stop coming to church because of what happened. So I told Tommy, I said, I'm going to put her... Uh, repair on my credit card. I really don't have the money to do all this, you know. But I said, I'm going to get that window repaired. I called her. I sent Safe Light Auto out to her shop where she worked, and they replaced the window for her, and I paid for it. It cost me like $165 or so, I think it was. And then I was talking one day to my friend up in New York, the one who's been supportive of my ministry for so many years. And I told him, you know, what had happened and what I did. And it just so happened that at the same time, shortly thereafter, we found out that the water heater in our house, our first house that we bought, was bad. And I said, oh, dear Lord, how much is that going to cost? Well, we looked into it, and we got an estimate for like, what was it, $1,200 something? Like $1,200 to replace the water heater at the house. And, of course, we didn't have the money. We didn't know what we were going to do. We thought we might have to borrow the money from his parents, which we didn't want to do. We could help it. Long story short, 
He didn't bother telling me, but Claude turned around and sent me the $1,200 to get the water heater replaced. Didn't even tell me he was going to do it. He just surprised me and sent me the $1,200. I think by then we had already, already borrowed the money from your parents. So we were able to go right back to his parents immediately and say, oh, here's the money right back. We don't need it after all from you. Then we turned around and got the work done, and it only cost us, instead of $1,200, it only cost us, like, what, $800 or something like that? Anyway, I can't remember all the numbers. But you see, we wound up with change. We wound up with extra. You see... I'm telling you folks, when I say you can't outgive God, you can't outgive God. But if you have misplaced faith, if you have mislaid faith, if your faith is not fully and completely and entirely in the Word of God, in the promises of God, in what God has said, then, sweetheart, don't expect to reap the benefits of it. Amen. The Bible said a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. The Word of God said when we go to God in prayer and we ask, said if you ask and you doubt nothing, doubting nothing, you're going to get what you've asked God for. But you got to be able to go with your faith completely, entirely in the promises of God. You've got to be able to be single-minded. The Bible said that a double-minded man, if you ask and yet you doubt it, the Word of God said, let not that man think he shall receive anything of the Lord. If you're double-minded, if you mislaid your faith, if you're trying to put part of your faith in God and part of your faith somewhere else, don't think for a minute you're going to get anything from God. You might as well know right now it ain't going to happen. So you might as well put your energy into trusting the Word of God. I tell people when they're sick and they're struggling with illness, let me tell you what you need to do. You need to go to the Word of God. You need to look up every single scripture you can find with the word healed in it. Go to a concordance, look up the word healed, and then look up every one of those scriptures and just read every one of those scriptures where God healed somebody, where the Lord healed somebody. I said, I'm going to tell you, by the time you read enough of those scriptures, it's going to get into your spirit that God is serious about healing the sick. Hallelujah. God is serious about delivering those who are struggling in their body. If you get that into your mind and into your your soul and into your spirit, you're going to be able to be single-minded and believe God to honor His Word. But you got to, it's where you put your energies in is where you're going to get your answer out. Remember the story of the woman who crawled on her hands and knees so she could lay hold of the hem of the Lord's garment? The Bible said she had spent all her living on doctors. She had spent all her living, every dime she had, every penny she could make, she spent on doctors. Well, what does that tell you? That tells me that that's where her faith was. Hello now. That's where her faith was. She believed that eventually I'll find a doctor who can help me. Well, she tried that. And it didn't work. All of a sudden, she heard of this man who was able to touch the eyes of the blind and the blind could see. He was able to place his ears in the ears of the deaf and when he pulled them out, the deaf could hear. He was able to take the lame by the arm and lift them to their feet and immediately their ankles and their legs were strengthened and they were able to walk and leap and run. I'll bet you that lady went around Long before she crawled on her hands and knees to reach the hem of his garment, I'll bet you a dime to a donut she went around town and asked as many people as she could, have, have you ever heard of this Jesus fella? Did, did you ever see any of these miracles he's supposed to have performed? Oh, yes, I was there one day when he did this. I was there one day when he did that. I'll bet you a dime to a donut, Lisa, she invested a good deal of energy 
in learning about this man Jesus. I doubt highly she heard one little testimony, one little story, and determined in her mind, if I can but touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. No, I bet you she invested a lot of energy to learn about this guy. And the more she heard, the more she took in, the more her faith began to peak, the more her faith began to grow. And all of a sudden she said, you know what? From the sounds of things, I don't think he even needs to know I'm there. If I crawl on my hands and my knees, all I have to do is touch the hem of his garment and I'll bet you I'll be healed. Hallelujah. Uh -huh. Why? Because all of a sudden her faith was no longer misplaced. It was no longer mislaid. It was no longer in the doctors. No, now her faith was completely, totally, entirely focused on Jesus. That's my answer right there. All I have to do is touch the hem of his garment and I'll be healed. A lot of times people come into the house of God and they've mislaid their faith. You ever misplace your keys? Can't figure out what in the world did I do with my guy. I normally have them right here, but by God, I can't find them. And you're searching all over the house, and then finally you go to that hook you hang your pants on, and you reach into the pocket, and there they are, Bill. You never took them out of your pocket. You ever done that? A lot of Christians come into the house of God, and they've mislaid their faith. They've started trusting what the doctors say rather than what God says. They start trusting what scientists say rather than what God says. They start trusting philosophy. Well, if I'm good enough, I'll go to heaven. See, that's a man-made philosophy. Good folks go to heaven, bad people go to hell. That's man-made philosophy. They trust the traditions of their church, even though the Word of God does not support their traditions. Mm -hmm. They trust their denomination or the organization, the religion they belong to. They trust that organization more than they trust the Word of God itself. Oh, bless God, if Watchtower Bible Society doesn't say it, then it isn't so. I don't care what the Watchtower Bible Society says. I care what the Word of God says because God's the one that breathed that Word, not the Watchtower Bible Society. And I'm going to tell you a little secret. People can twist what God has said all out of shape, try to make it say all kinds of things. How many people in our community today are out of church, away from God, because of mislaid faith? Uh -huh. Amen. They trust the denomination. They trust their preacher. What comes out of the preacher's mouth, they believe it more than what comes out of the Word of God. I remember when I was young and I was just a young man and God had called me to preach and I would hear preachers preaching about homosexuals and all that stuff. And I remember thinking the thought, literally, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't grace work for them too? <laughs> Wouldn't grace work for them too? I couldn't for the life of me understand how it was that grace was supposed to work for these folks and those folks and them folks and these folks. But somehow or another, these people over here were just godless heathens who were going to split hell wide open and there wasn't a hope of heaven or a chance outside of hell that they could be saved. I couldn't see it, Lisa. It didn't make sense to me. I knew there was some sort of a problem with this theology. I knew even as a kid, I knew there was a problem with that theology. I said, that, see, because my confidence was in the Word of God. Whosoever believeth on me shall never die. Whosoever Amen. believeth on me shall have everlasting life. Amen. That's what Jesus said. And I'm thinking, wait a minute, doesn't the Word of God focus on Faith, not works. Doesn't the Word of God focus on what we believe, not on what we say, not on what we do, but on what we believe? Now, what we believe is going to affect what we say. It's going to affect what we do. But what we believe is the most important thing. And that's why I preach every Sunday. If you're part of the LGBT community, don't stop believing. Don't surrender your faith. Don't let anybody tear your faith out of your hands. Don't mislay your faith. Don't believe mom and dad. Don't believe the preacher you grew up under. Don't believe the pope. Don't believe a prophet. Don't believe a priest. Don't believe the pastor. Don't believe your family members. Don't believe 
your neighbors. Don't believe that fool on the internet. Don't believe that preacher on TV. Believe the Word of God. Hallelujah. Get your faith in line. Get it where it's supposed to be. That's right. My God have mercy. More people will wind up away from God for eternity because of mislaid faith. More than anything else. More than anything else. People who lived for a while the Christian life, people who claim to believe this gospel, are going to wind up losing out in eternity with God simply because they believe something other than God. They trusted something else besides the Word of God. If your faith has been mislaid, oh, children, do what you got to do to get your faith back in line. You know why the church is here? And I'm closing, I promise. I'm finishing up. Do you know why the church of, of Jesus Christ exists? Do you know why that we do what we do? Because this is the place where you come to every week to get your faith tweaked. And if it's begun to kind of go a little off track one way or a little off track the other, this is where you come to get it right back in line. Hallelujah. Amen. I don't know how many times I went to church and I was struggling and I was really going through a battle. I was going through a torment from the enemy. And I'd come to church and the singing of the songs of Zion and the preaching of the word of God. Lisa, all of a sudden, it would kind of push me a little this side and push me a little that side and get me lined back up again, get my faith back where it needed to be. And I'd leave the church healed. I'd leave the church delivered. I came in depressed out of my mind, and I'd leave delivered from that depression. I came in sick, and I left healed. I came in feeling bad and I left feeling glorious. Hallelujah. Why? Because it's in this place. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. The church is here to help you get your faith lined back up. To get it back where it needs to be. How many times have you come into the house of God and... Your faith was kind of pushed to one side or another. And it was in the course of that service that God got you back on track. And right there, Johnny, in that church service, you were able to receive from God what you needed. Why? Because you got back on track. You got back to single-mindedness. You got back in focus. Hallelujah. Amen. Aren't you glad today for the church? Yes. Amen. I am. I'm going to tell you, my whole life, I have benefited from the existence of God's church. People say, I don't have to go to church to be saved. Well, I'll tell you what, I wouldn't want to try to be saved without the church. I wouldn't. Amen. I wouldn't. No. I appreciate the benefits of God's house. I appreciate the benefits of the Word of God. Amen? Amen. 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 Mislaid faith. Get your faith in order. Become single-minded. Know what you believe and believe what you know. And you will experience the full benefits of God's blessing in your life. Would you stand with me today?